So welcome back to Women Matters. It's quite a while that we had interrupted the series, which took place every month for about four years. And Gertrude here is one of the founding members and also Tammy, who we hope that she will make it to come in again. And I'm glad to have found more women who want to contribute for this uh, series. And today we wanted to talk <laughs> That's the obvious topic, uh, the coronavirus, the epidemic, and what can be the feminine response or the feminine resources to give an answer to the situations in which we are all over the world in one way or other. So, but before we talk about that, I would uh, ask everybody to introduce themselves and who they are, where they are, and so on. And I would like to start with Gertraud because she is, she has, how do you say, a right as uh, ancianita in Italian. She is the longest. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how he is. I, I forgot all my English. I'm so Well, excited. we started it together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So you take over. Uh, so Gertraud from Germany, middle of Germany, north of Frankfurt a town called Gießen. Some Americans know it from the military. And um, I'm a coach, trainer, consultant. And um, the coronavirus has brought me not more paid business, but a lot more activity. <laughs> so, so it's a lot uh, going on in the, in the different worlds. And um, yeah, and I have started with one of our methods that we created. I started uh, two blocks where people can come, one in English and two in German. <laughs> uh, so people can come if they have any, um, yeah, if they are triggered by, by, the, by this nowadays <laughs> condition. So, yeah, and um, maybe just my husband is living with me, which is very great because if you're alone, it's a little bit different. And we have weekly calls with our girls who live in abroad, I mean, Hamburg and, and Austria and so on. So, yeah, that's, I leave it to that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad, Tammy, that you are back and that you made it to come in. So I give the word to you just for the introduction. It's also one of the old members of Women Matters. Thank you. Founding members, actually. Actually, the yeah. three of us started it. Exactly. It was our talk, Tammy, you and me, and yeah, the last exactly. of the Unity and Diversity talks. The founding members are back. Wonderful. <laughs> And I think that my life is completely different since, since meeting both of you. So there's, there's also that, so it's good to be here. Um, I'm in the Netherlands. I arrived here with Harry um, on the 28th of February, so it was, or 29th, so it was the day after the first case here in the Netherlands. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, uh, not my home, so I'm not, I don't feel the difference as much um, in terms of like, you know, seeing places that are closed and the effects in, in the city. I've been very happily um, quarantining <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, my my heart is is really feeling for all the people that are losing their losing people and so i've been really feeling that uh and i'm i'm grateful to get together with all of you to be able to share time together and to and to look at it together so thank you so much heidi for inviting everyone and for bringing this all together Thank you for coming back again. And we have today three new women 
uh, two from uh, Pacific Coast and one from South Africa. Who of you wants to continue? Okay, Anneli. My name is Anneli. Um, I'm from South Africa. I'm currently in Johannesburg. I'm these days more a professional nomad, <clears throat> but because of I would have been in Europe at the moment if everything went well, but so I'm here now. Um, yes, for me, it's very interesting. I have been living alone for almost 18 years. So for me, it's just life, you know, it's being in one place. I can't go for walks. We're not allowed to go for even a walk with the dogs or with ourselves. So that cat, because I love to walk every day, that sort of gets to me, but I can swim every day. So I'm very grateful for that. And especially the swimming helps me as well to balance my left and right parts, my masculine and feminine. <clears throat> so it has been very nourishing and nurturing. Um, and I'm really grateful, Heidi, for the, for the invitation and to be here with you all. So I'm looking forward to this time together with you all. Okay, so Christine? Where you originated from, Haneli? Yes, I'm, I'm, I, I was born in South Africa, yes. yes. And it's very interesting, the current situation here. Um, I was with somebody who came back from Switzerland, literally after we had our first cases here, and people brought from Europe to South Africa. And so it was a very interesting time. And then to fly back two days later, because it was in another town, but my own sense of awareness of taking care of others, because I was on a plane full of international tourists and to self-isolate, even though I wasn't sick, but to self-isolate even before they asked us to isolate and before it really hit South Africa. So we're still in the early days. We've got about 1,655 cases and about eight deaths. So it's still in the beginning part, I would say. And because our community is so broad, and we have so many vulnerable people. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, I'm Christine uh, Baser, and I live in uh, Southern California in Carlsbad. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I think we have been isolating my husband and myself. I think this is the end of our second week, but I, I kind of have lost track. It could be second or third week, I'm not sure. Um, it's going okay. Uh, I don't know anybody specifically who has been affected by the virus directly. I do have a, um, a patient who lost a good friend of hers. Um, so that's the closest I've come to knowing anybody who passed away or has been very sick. Um, you know, each, I don't go out very much just to get some groceries, uh, and each time that is, you know, a unique experience. There's some other layer of protection or, or something new that we have to do um, or be aware of. Uh, um, but can't complain, really. Um, my husband and I kind of wonder if this is what retirement would be like, <laughs> being home and, you know, slowing things down a great deal and, you know, just trying to get things done at home. Um, I get a little bit of the news, but I, I titrate that pretty carefully. I, I really don't want to hear every aspect of what's uh, going on with the nitty gritty. I just try to make sure that I, uh, I get the highlights of what's going on in the world. Um, and uh, our both we have two daughters and both of them I think are safe and doing their thing away from us. So, um, don't worry too much about them. They're both bright enough to take care of themselves. So that's good. And I'm happy to be here. I know Heidi, uh, four years ago, we met at the Integral European Conference and uh, was lucky enough to visit her and Mark two years ago in Italy at her lovely home. So we've kept in touch since then. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah, thank you. And we were planning to have a uh, uh, contribution for this year's con conference together, which now won't be. 
while all the others of you, I have done an interview already in the Wisdom Factory. So I know you, but you might not know each other. So it will be <laughs> very interesting. But last not least, our youngest member, uh, Quinn. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Quinn. Uh, I'm a PhD student studying motivation in California. And um, it's my fifth week alone at home. And I haven't even gone out to do grocery shopping. So it's a uh, complete self-quarantine. <laughs> okay, thank you. So the topic is how can we as women contribute to a resolution of this crisis and let's say all the other crises which are around and before and afterwards? And what is the feminine quality which can help us or can help the world to, yeah, to deal with these challenges? That won't be the last one, I'm quite sure. You know, so just brainstorming, whoever has a, an idea, unmute yourself and say, oh, did I say something about me? I don't think no. I did. Oh, I'm Heidi, and what you see behind me, the virtual background, this is my garden about four weeks ago with all these lovely anemones, and even there were daffodils still. And I'm living here sort of alone. There's a couple still here, a German couple, but they will go back as soon as they can. And uh, you know my, uh, my ground, it is really in the middle of nowhere. So for me, my days are really not much different than before. I'm only more on the internet, but I can freely go in, in the wood and do a walk. You know, I cannot go to my normal supermarket because we have the restrictions. We only can go to our little village here to do shopping, but I do it maximum once a week. And yeah, I can live with this. And I like to be at home. I mean, and to observe nature and everything. It's, it's for me, it's, yeah, we will come to that. Not really a big deal, but I'm aware that for other people it is. So I'm very grateful that I'm living here. Okay, over to you. Um, I will start by saying, uh, as the only Asian woman <laughs> in the group, and Chinese woman, um, I... I want to mention two, uh, three things. Uh, the first thing is about racism. And the second thing is universal loneliness. I think it's manifested or exposed in this crisis. And the third thing is fear. Um, how do we deal with fear? Um, uh, I think uh, racism is not so big a topic, but I think I would like to start with it. Um, specifically, um, I'm a very sensitive person and at the onset of the coronavirus here in Cali, I noticed a lot of um, microaggressions um, from other people. And that really got me thinking because I've been living here for almost 10 years. I moved here at 21. And um, it got me thinking about uh, racial identity and cultural identity. Uh, and there is a, a feeling of um, marginalization and exclusion. And of course, the first response was uh, defense. Uh, this is unjust. Um, and, uh, and then I, got, I looked into the conversations on racism in uh, the United States uh, during this coronavirus, which is much more severe uh, in eastern part of the country or um, you know the middle part and i noticed that they pointed out something that's true and very interesting that is the chinese people have been racist against other people especially uh, african-american people uh, or our lives especially in china and that's true and that reminded me of how my country treated people minority groups in our country, including people in Xinjiang and Tibet. And then I realized that it's not about the duality of victim versus villain. Um, 
for the majority of us, the racist is within every one of us. So how do we deal with it? And I feel like it might be a feminine approach in that it's um, not distinguish, distinguishing between self versus others, but um, seeing the unity of all. But that is a question that I don't have the answer for. Like, how do we solve the racism within every single one of us? Thank you for bringing that. And I'm, I just want to recognize my own privilege. I come from uh, Vancouver. <clears throat> and uh, I think that there's a really strong awareness, especially on the West Coast, about how race plays out and um, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what to say other than I really appreciate it being brought here to be looked at. And I know that um, I've looked in myself to see where the social conditioning um, it, uh, informs where racism wells up for me. Um, and I do my best to, to look at it and be with it, to understand where did that come from? Because it's not how I personally identify. And I recognize that it is all around it, uh, us and it's often visible. So thank you for bringing words and your experience to that. Um, yeah, thank you, Quinn, for bringing this up as a topic. I think it's uh, a useful thing for us to explore. I'm hopeful, I guess, that there has been conversation about um, certainly stigmatizing people. That's the first racist theme that has come up. Um, and also looking at healthcare delivery in the States, people have been talking about, you know, within the past week, fairly frequently, you know, the inequities and, and trying to understand better how is the healthcare system serving uh, people of color. Um, and that I think is coming up kind of automatically or maybe not automatically, but um, it's coming up as a very legitimate and worthwhile uh, discussion uh, amidst this whole uh, COVID-19. So I that's what gives me hope is that um, it's part of the conversation and trying to look at that. I don't think we'll understand it for a long time because we barely understand the illness, no less how it's being played out among people of color. But um, at least, you know, it, it clearly will be uh, explored. And just a clarification, Quang, are you, uh, are, have you stayed in isolation because you fear for your safety? Uh, honestly, uh, I'm a very, very cautious person. Um, and also, uh, the racism wasn't really about safety here in California. It's just, uh, it's, uh, it's, in, it's the emotional consequence of it. So yeah and also i'm super sensitive so i may not save other people yeah. in south africa we have a very interesting situation and we are still in the early days with the virus itself but it's very interesting how of course we have such a diverse society how people across races suddenly pulls together. We saw it a few times in, in the past, like when we had the World Cup, where we were, we were um, hosting that, people were just, there was no such thing as race at the time. People got together. And that was a celebration. This is now a crisis. 
And it's very interesting to see how people are, are opening their hearts to each other. And even our government has been extremely um, visionary in how they're handling it. And, and the, the inequalities, certain people has certain rights during the week because we've got, we've got a complete lockdown, but certain people have certain rights, like in the vulnerable communities, they have rights that we don't have. And we're okay with it. Most, most South Africans are, because we understand where the hell they live and what the inequalities are about. So nobody's really making a big deal out of it. They, they just understand it. And suddenly there's a sense, and I just feel it in my body as well, that firstly, we are all South Africans. Doesn't matter what race it is. But it's very interesting how an event, recent event impacted all of us in some way of this pulling together part, this united part on a deeper level, is that two French doctors this past week made horrific statements on television about using Africa's pauperized communities to use as to use for the vaccines to test it out. And everybody just doesn't matter what race you were, everybody just got together and say, <laughs> don't think as Africa is your um, your, lab your laboratory, you know, you, um, but it was very interesting to feel the collective in that moment, in those moments, how suddenly um, race disappears. And things that we would usually be very intolerant about each other, suddenly it's drifting away. So I know there has been, in the beginning, there has been a lot of racism against Chinese people in South Africa, because we also have a lot of Eastern uh, cultures here. But since we had our first cases, it's as if now it's, you know, when you walk in this, if you can go and do some shopping for food, you can feel that suddenly that's gone. You know, it's everybody's on the same level here. The virus doesn't know race. And people are get it's starting to sink in that it doesn't know race or gender or wealth or any of those things that we used to differentiate ourselves. So in that sense, I have some hope because it feels to me it's also uniting us and that we're seeing we are all affected by it. And yes, some people like in here, they, their circumstances will expose them a lot more than other, others. And people have been reaching out, they've been they put together food packets and blankets and whatever they could for people to live more safely as well, who lives in very harsh conditions. So it feels like our hearts are coming out. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. And like I said earlier, it's, it's beginning times, but it, it's, it's for me a good step. You know, it's something good's happening out of it all. Just to throw in, is it the feminine quality to be connected with the heart and to care for for the others, independent who they are, just the me. I was just thinking exactly that. Um, so I, I'm also working with brain physiology. Um, and what you described, Quinn and Hanalee, was like, this is the adrenaline um, response. So more the male go for hunt. And this draws people apart. So everybody might be an enemy. And somebody who doesn't look like me is per se an enemy before I decide not. <laughs> um, and the, I save more female or at least I, I, I talk about the, the, um, the hormones, though the oxytocin is about bringing the group together, bonding, creating new solutions. And so it's, it's kind of a decision. So when I'm in this, oh, there might be a danger, 
it's not yet here. So there's the saber tooth tiger around, but I don't know where. <laughs> so this is um, basic thing. And then I can decide, do I go with fear? Do I go with enemy? Or do I bring my, the people around me or in my, my community together and um, bond together and, and see what we can do for each other to face that enemy t together? And, and it is a decision. It's not just by default. It's, it's like when I listen to, to the states, um, to the news there, it's from the leadership, I mean, from the federal leadership to, to infuse that adrenaline-based thing. And I hear it like from Cuomo, or I hear it now from you, there are some leaders and the queen and also our chancellor. It's like, let's see the signs and let's come together and we support each other and something like, yeah, this, this uh, connection. And I think that is more uh, this, yeah, how do I want to do it? And what is my way of, uh, as a leader, how do I want to lead? Do I want to lead into a war where we hunt the enemy <laughs> or do I want to protect and, and have the group together? And I think that is more female. So that's what came up. And I'm very interested in your other two topics, Quinn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. While you were talking, I realized the connection between fear and the current, um, I guess, um, uh, separation within the country. Um, so I, I thought about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how the fear brought us back to the maybe orange level, so survival. And Kil Ken Wilber's um, hierarchy mm -hmm. is the orange level. And um, I it's just remember red. that, yeah, red or orange, like also beige. Those no? two. Beige is the poor survivor. Yeah. Yeah, and I just uh, remember that uh, Wilbur says uh, there we have a central gravity towards a certain level, but we are spread it across different levels. I feel like for me, at least, uh, there's definitely a part of me at least 25% <laughs> on the orange level. So uh, the fear really uh, regressed me back to this level. And I feel like this is a good chance for us to examine this part of ourselves because a lot of us identify with being green. But when um, fear is incited, um, how we regress to this um, limited consciousness and how we act from it is something of reflection. And another thing that I uh, wanted to discuss was um, uh, about leadership. <laughs> so specifically, uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, called coronavirus uh, the Chinese virus. Um, I feel like it's a very interesting thing because uh, I feel like he's trying to create this um, external enemy in order to create an internal collision to avoid any criticism on him. So yeah, that's the two points I wanted to discuss. I do think that is a defense mechanism. Christine, uh, can you as psychologist talk about defense mechanisms in this case? Specifically Trump's or just in general? <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't speak to Trump's. I mean, he's just beyond, uh, beyond explanation. He's in another category. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think the, the thing we're mostly defending against is the fear, the anxiety of the unknown, the uncertainty that arises. And now, you know, we have layers of health concerns and economic concerns and concerns with losing connection with people because we, we're not with them. 
So we have a lot of fears and um, maybe the feminine response to that is, I think, to listen and to try to connect. Um, I think men care. Uh, I don't think caring is unique to women, but I think they care from more of an action standpoint. So their defenses are going to look more, again, more like the warrior. They're probably going to dip down more into a warrior uh, stance than women would. Um, and women are going to go more inner, internal. Uh, and the isolation probably, you know, people often isolate as a defense, but clearly in this case, it, it's not always helpful because isolation brings its own level of problems um, by feeling so disconnected. Um, and another fear of being so alone and, you know, do I matter? What happens if I'm all alone? Do I matter to anybody uh, anymore? I think that comes up for a lot of people. In previous conversations, we have um, stated that probably a feminine quality is to be able to deal with uncertainty much better than, uh, than men do, maybe for the biological fact that women have children and have to wait until they come and how they develop. I don't know. So I wonder what you say for that. And if you see this in you, how can you meet this fear and this uncertainty in your in your own life. I mean, everybody, I think, has had at least moments of fear and, and, and anxiety, for sure. So how can you be here now, tranquil, sort of, at least? And <laughs> what did you do? I can tell you one ex experience I had just when I flew back. So I still had the sense of awareness of I might infect other people because I was on an airplane, airplane, although I'm not sick myself. And I walked down to get some food and it's like two kilometers away. And there was a big storm coming up. And I didn't want to use an Uber because I was now conscious of this whole thing that I might infect somebody else. And so I had to rush down and I didn't want to turn back. It was, it was almost there when this almost upon me. And I continued to the, to the shopping center and I quickly bought the few things I needed. And as I came out, I, 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 it was quite an uphill that I had to walk back. And I was exhausted because I was trying to rush against time to get out of the storm as well, because with us, those type of storms are not normal rain. You know, it's a lot of thunder and things like that. It's not necessarily safe to walk in storms like that. But I had to rush up. And when I got home, I, f I, I realized I exhausted myself completely. I could have just walked, you know, and not rushed. But it also drained me on emotional level. So that night, the whole night, so now I'm worried that I opened myself up to the virus because of my, you know, my level of awareness, my level of consciousness, because I was in fear. And that whole night, while I was lying on my bed, I just spoke to my body. And I said, let's calm down. The whole night, you won't believe it, but the whole night till the next morning. I was speaking to my cells, to my neurons, to all my systems and organs. And I said, we are well, we are safe. We are loving, we are cared for, we're in good health. And the next morning I felt rejuvenated and the fear was gone, but it took, it took effort to continue the whole night, literally the whole night, because I knew on some level I had to raise my own frequency again. And I also had to tell my body that, that, that my body, she's okay, you know, and I need to, needed to nurture her. And the next day I just took it easy and I rested and I swam and the movement also helped me. I was lucky that I could swim. And then to realize that follow, you know, that evening of the next day, my own, how I brought this fear onto myself. And just to sit with it and to say, it's actually okay not to judge myself for that. And just to sit fit with it in a loving space to accept it. That, that was the scenario and I did that. 
So that helped me. For me, um, we three minutes from our house, we can go into the meadows. And um, so this is very nice. Like people go on this side and I go here, but we can say hello and sometimes chat from the distance. That's, that's really nice. And, and neighbors. Uh, so we, we just ask each other if they need anything, but mostly they have family here in the, in the village. Um, where I get uh, kind of nervous or so is uh, shopping, but not shopping as, a, as an event. So it's, it's more like, okay, when you come home, you wash your hands and things like that. But when people don't tolerate the, when they try to sneak in and they forgot something and they just don't care. And so I really feel like physically, I feel it like, don't you care? I mean, like, so I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's fear, it's in being annoyed and, and, and thinking they are careless and uh, some young people, it was really hard to, to, bring them down because they wanted to party and so the police had to step in and then I'm also like um, is it overreaching from politics or is it okay when I see what what happens in Hungary when they just dissolved themselves the parliament so to have actually they now have a dictator there and it's Europe <laughs> so I mean the free Europe uh, so so there are some like do they um like the the after 9 11 there was a law that they can go to war whenever the presidents feel like and nobody reversed it and and so that some laws might just keep the the rights uh more but on the other side uh, when I trust, for example, I trust our chancellor. I'm not, I don't think every move she takes and every politics she, she does is, uh, so I would agree, but so she has a genuine, she is a, a scientist herself, <laughs> so she's a physicist, and, and there is a genuine... Um, understanding of people and needs and 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 i think she wants to do good and and if i have that trust then then it's okay then i can can i adjust more easily but when i look to hungary or to to other countries or <laughs> watch the us oh sorry to watch the us notes um news then then i'm i'm really like then I have to contain myself. What is sorry? Yeah, thanks for that, Gertrude. Um, I, uh, when I think about the, the, leaders and leadership um yeah your chancellor has stood out for me in looking at someone that i have a felt sense of trust in in how she presents very grounded calm and real felt very real to me how she expressed herself of course it was in german so i didn't understand the words but i could <clears throat> i could feel her her uh, her in herself in that moment and as a juxtaposition from what I've seen in in the states and and Christine like you mentioned it's um, 
I don't even know how to explain the what's happening there at the top. <laughs> um, and so it's it's very disappointing to have such demonstrated xenophobia, uh, phobia on that's just what's presented. And um, and I think so. Then to your question, Heidi, around the role of women. For me, I think part of it is is just being uh, really understanding the depth and complexity and the wholeness of any situation. So being able to see what's needed and being able to kind of more deeply consider um, how entangled everything actually is. And so part of, I think, what we have an opportunity to be with is if we were to reimagine the world anew, what would that look like? And I think that that's, it's a, a really important opportunity right now to look at this freeze frame, this moment of stop. Who are we? What do we need? And how can we transition from the slavery kind of economy that's been uh, instituted over the last 150-ish years to something that's more whole and that is more in line with humans as they are in, and, and you know, obviously that's a big question. Uh, and it has a lot of parts, uh, but I think it's worthwhile to to reimagine ourselves as we move forward. Yeah, I, I feel like um, this radical acceptance is such a feminine approach. The radical acceptance of fear and go through the bottom of the tower <laughs> to see like what you want to build for the new world. Yeah, I agree with you. Did anybody have thoughts about the Queen's um, speech, since she's a woman? Um, did, were people surprised that she spoke up or did they have any feelings about what she said? I just heard a few m m uh, minutes of it, but I I've had the feeling she was very contained and very like bringing together <laughs> and the funny thing was they presented it one sentence queen one sentence um a donald trump and it was so so radically <laughs> different um and i really had to laugh because she was like yeah let's hear the scientist and he said, I have the feeling this, medi uh, this medical treatment could be <laughs> whatever. So it was really like, it was so, these, these contrasts were so severe <laughs> that I really had to laugh. And I would like, to, that's what I wanted to add um, when I got interrupted. Um, what I realize is, is that some of my colleagues and friends, they have to stay home. Like before um, one colleague, his, uh, his wife was at home with the three little boys and now she, he supports her in her business because he gets money from the government. And so, I mean, like he's creating a, completely new bond with his children not this father who comes home after a long <coughs> sorry after a long day but he's doing stuff that his wife wouldn't do so that that more boys <laughs> boys thing and and the other i mean how he talks about his boys is so so soft and so loving and and so i think that was already in him, but in his role, it was not nurtured. 
and, and the other colleague as well, he has five kids at home. So it's really, I get that men now uh, nurture their female side in staying with the kids and homeschooling them and really getting conversations they never had before. And, and I think, not that I like that we have that virus, but that is a very good thing happening. Yeah. Isn't it curious that we need something like a virus that, that it is possible to go out of the roles that we cannot decide to change roles by ourselves, but that we need, let's say, the permission of, of such an uh, extraordinary event to <clears throat> explore other ways of living. That's also what I hope that, that will last, that we get the idea that things could be different and that we, we have now, and many people might now have the idea where to go, where it can go. Before, nobody knew what it would look like, but now they can make experience with it. So, and for me also the feminine role is to hold the space for this development in some way, what we are doing now, for instance, and in many other places to, to, to explore how that could be. And by the leaders, I wanted to say our Conte, uh, Italian uh, president, he is good. If he still had Savini, it would be a catastrophe. But uh, this person, I have much trust in him. And uh, yeah, leadership is so crucial. May I uh, say one more thing? I don't want to. <laughs> um, Cuomo said, people say, when can we go back to normal? There is no normal to go back to. This is done. He was really like very animate about it and said, this has changed our lives. If you lost your grandfather, if you lost somebody really dear to you because of this, there is no old normal we can go back to. So we have to create anyway. <laughs> we have to create a new. And, and, and I think that is... There is no normal we can go back to. So let us, we might as well create a future that doesn't support. Um, I just read an article about um, how the, uh, the coronavirus could come or be a pandemic because of the uh, climate change. So the bats behavior change because the insects are not there anymore and so they have to find food somewhere else and they go somewhere where they weren't before and they have less of so this is like we have to think about this as well and and so let's create a new future no not going back to normal I think there are many theories about where that comes from. I think uh, these things are part of human life and they come sooner or later all the time. We, were, we thought with our hybris that we uh, have everything, you know, we can dominate everything, but uh, probably we, we can't. What I would like in the future is when I now look into the valley, the air is as clear and as lovely, the colors as you know, also the air, when you say it smells different, it doesn't smell at all. It is like, like sweet in some way. I would like to have the future and air and water like this. So not going back to normal with the pollution. No, thank you. I want to yeah. share something. Pre sorry. Yeah, I Sorry, wanted to say Christine probably has to go earlier, so... Uh, if... no, it's Christine, you can, she can speak. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How you want. Now, I saw something now, Gertrude, that you sp speak about the family structure and the, 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 the dads in that family structure. A friend of mine from Brazil has started online creative events for children and... Um, because she works with children, but now she can't let them come to her. To her. So now she, has, she had to do something different. And she invited me to join some of them. And it's the 
family sitting there doing very creative things for the little ones. And it's the dads that come, not the moms, it's the dads that come. It's precious just to be present to this and to see the dads help. We, the first time I shared, I was there, we created little mouses and um, mice and um, penguins out of clay. And the dads were all doing their own as well. And it was incredible. We're four or five year olds. It was fantastic to see that. And but for me about creativity, what I just want to mention in terms of what we co-create now from here onwards, that a big part of creativity, the feminine part of creativity is receptivity. And for that, you had to be, to be still and quiet to receive these ideas of what's possible. It's not that action thing in the beginning. And once that seed is like the baby in the womb is fertilized, it grows by itself, the egg. And then it's holding the space for it. So I totally resonate, Heidi, with what you said. Because if you just look at our own bodies and how we birth into the world, once that egg is fertilized, we just need to create a space for it to grow. And we can, with both our masculine and feminine, we can fertilize the egg and the seed that now can start growing. So I'm, I really feel that that receptive part of ourselves, both in male and female, is going to develop out of this as well, because we are in one space. And we can't do whatever we used to do. I see your smile, Quinn. <laughs> no, I was smiling at the silence. <laughs> We're all leaving space <laughs> for what will emerge. <laughs> My only concern, I, I love that metaphor of, of the womb and create, you know, holding that space for things to grow. My only concern is that, you know, what forces may push in and occupy the space that if there's no, our bodies as women defend against uh, foreign things coming in and invading uh, that's a natural response to kick out invaders uh, from that space. But at a societal level, how do we hold space and not allow invasion from forces that are detrimental? By detrimental forces, what do you mean specifically? Um, I don't know. It could be uh, it could be bad leadership. Um, it could be uh, going back to normal, which is you know the, more of a patriarchal way of looking at things. Um, I guess you know if if we have a new way of being now during this period of isolation and trying to connect and slow down, if we still hold space for that what if, again, that space ends up being taken over uh, by people who want to uh, be concerned about business, be concerned about money in a way that's not caring, but is opportunistic? So I think when we are, uh, when we have listened enough and we have done our preparation work, we women are called to step up, to do something. I have no idea what but we cannot just allow others to take over and to lead us back into the same situation. And so far, we didn't really make our voices heard enough, in my opinion. 
And I think we need to come into a sort of self-confidence that we are able to do that. I don't actually know how we, we need to, to sort of figure that out, but I'm really determined to do something, what is needed. I don't know yet what is needed, what I can do, but I want to do it because I always was hiding and was complaining about the bad uh, man and the bad capitalism and the bad, I don't know what. I know Tammy much less than me, but <laughs> uh, I think it's time that we women collectively stand up and say no. We have to figure out maybe also here coming together again and figure out what we could do actually outside in the world when we have um, found our confidence and our, our power. Let me take it back. This image doesn't end with pregnancy. It ends with, a, with giving birth. And for me, giving birth to my daughters, it was like I never knew how much power I had have before. It was like, oh, I can't anymore. I, there's no way I can go through this, the pain and everything. And then there is this, power that comes through and that really wants to be expressed without, I mean, you, you cannot stop it. It's, it's like life itself. And, and this is what comes out of this. And, and this is going with what Heidi said. It's, it's like, what do we want to hold space for? So what baby is going to be born? And then really, when it's due, to have all the forces, all the power that, that, and it's beyond that I could do like I'm training or I'm, it, it's really beyond. And, and I think every woman has that uh, baby or not. I mean, like, you don't have to be a mother to have that power. I think this is like ho holding space for that that wants to emerge and then putting all your, your power behind it and being supported by, by your sisters, by your yeah, midwives, by <laughs> whomever, and even the men. For me, it was very supportive, yeah. So, but it, it's my genuine power that came through. And it's bigger than me. So that's, that's what I, and I, I was just thinking about um, the Dalai Lama who said the, the Western women it's upon us to save the world. And Western, I mean, like people that, that are brought up, that are educated, that have this, yeah, are in a society that, that is um, kind of democracy. <laughs> yeah, I think this primordial force of which you are speaking I am hoping for that, that we have, that the moment of the birth will come and we all will do our part. So I really hope into that and I'm looking forward to that. Although it's also scary because we don't know what that will be. And there's also something like you don't know if you survive that. So it, it, it's really whole life on the line somehow. Thank you, Gertrude, for reminding me of that. I haven't thought about that in that way. And that tremendous surge. And, and there's also let go of, let go is a big part of it as well, to, to surrender and let go. It's not something you can control. 
And I think just in that by itself is something that we all collectively, we start just going into that type of energy. It can be incredible. So thank you very much for reminding me of that today. And you as well, Heidi, everyone. Yeah, I think we are sort of in the check out round. So I invite you to give your statements. Uh, I'm really grateful to have been here today. It was really nice to meet um, uh, Quinn and Christine. And nice to see you again, Hanalee. Um, and yeah, I guess I have been, I do live near a forest. So I've been spending, going there and taking my shoes off and really doing some earthing. Um, and so if that's one thing that I've been doing to take care of myself. And I think that that's, that's what I'd like to share to close is that I think that's most important first. And, uh, and so I've um, been doing Wim Hof breathing exercises and some exercise in the morning <clears throat> and trying to yeah, I get my feet out on the ground. And that's been really helpful to, to ground, to be able to release whatever fear is here because yes, we're in a totally different world now. And every day there's, you know, a new moment that, that I'm meeting. Uh, and so I've been grateful to be able to do that. And again, I recognize my privilege and, uh, at the same time, that is the step. And often at other parts of my life, I've, I've ran out the gate without really making sure I had my water and my snack. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a good realization for me to take care of myself first and then. So with that, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you, Heidi, for arranging this uh, meeting. And, and thank you, ladies, for coming and, and sharing. Um, I have some things to think about and, and will enjoy reflecting upon uh, this hour with you all. Um, and I wish you all well. Uh, I hope everybody takes care of themselves. Oh, that is my phone call. Thank you. Yeah, I just have gratitude and thank you, Heidi. Um, I can just feel this energy in my body, so I'm grateful for that. And I will go and ground it outside on the grass after this. So thank you very much, everyone, and for your wisdom and also for your vulnerability. And for the questions you're asking, um, thank you very much for that. Um, I want to thank Heidi for hosting uh, this discussion too. And um, I was really inspired by women in this group, um, by your wisdom, but also your artistic expression. The birthing metaphor really got me thinking. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, Gertrude? Yeah, it was great to meet everyone, the old ones and the new ones. And um, I thought, Christina, I, I must have met her in, in Schofog as well in Hungary. Uh, so I will find that out. <laughs> and Haneli, uh, my daughter was five months in Johannesburg for an intern at the baby home. And we were at the world conference there. So, so it was, yeah, I kind of know where you are. <laughs> and that's nice. And we have friends there. So another one. <laughs> Great to see you and and you and Quinn. It it 
Thank you very much for bringing up the, the topic of uh, racism because the, what Timmy said, the, the privilege of, so I have some African friends and I don't uh, experience what they do. So the police doesn't stop me in the middle of the night just because I'm black. <laughs> so it, it's kind of, um, yeah. Thank you for your perspective and would you share it? It's very special for me. So to, to see that my point of view and my perspective is one of millions, mil billions that could be. Yeah. Good reminder. Yeah, and I begin to thank Quinn also for being here because she brings a, a younger um, element into this round. And I'm very curious how, how it is for younger people. We did an interview and I will uh, bring it out in about two weeks or so. And it was very, very good what, what she was talking about. And I had an uh, idea of how life is for younger women today. I mean, when I was her age, I was behind the <laughs> behind somewhere with no consciousness at, at all you know so i'm really admiring the younger women who are uh, so aware of of so different the new generation so thank you to make us our conversation richer and to all you others, I'm, I'm really super grateful that you have followed the call. Uh, I did um, only last Friday, it became my soul matrix because uh, you know from uh, Wada Hasselman, I don't know if you know her, um, you can look it up. It's also some of the books are uh, translated, the um, archetypes of the soul. And um, my uh, matrix is connecting people, you know, so I was not wondering why I'm doing these things. <laughs> and obviously, it's what I meant to do. And I do it with so much joy and so much, you know, enthusiasm. And I thank you that you follow because otherwise I would be here alone with my nice flower background. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the moment. And I invite you to come next time. <laughs>